this 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 is a small um, workshop of three speakers, which is great because then we can go into more detail about their work, and that gives us some time for questions. So this kind of encapsulates um, everything that we're talking about at this forum, uh, because we're talking about the the holistic approach of looking at things with an ecological perspective, so that we understand when we make decisions about how we're managing our diet, our yards, our, our, our agricultural system, that we're taking into account these, the, the fact that it has an all components of it, whether it's the soil, the, the organisms above ground or us, and how it all interacts and is important. So we have, um, two, we have th uh, two scientists that are going to be speaking, um, Vera Krishik and Maggie Douglas, who are going to be talking to us about the scientific aspects of that. And that's really important because it's how we get some kind of grasp about what's happening in reality. Uh, and then, what, what in addition, it's really important how that gets translated to all of us so that we can use that information and the decisions we make in our lives and how our policymakers are informed. So a lot of us may or may not have access to the scientific literature, so the, the, the press is incredibly important in how that information gets um, relayed to the public. So a, a good media with um, good reporters who are accurately reporting what's happening in the science and is, is incredibly important. And so remember from Melinda's talk yesterday how important those media messages are. So I'd like to introduce um, the first speaker. Are you going up first, Maggie, then? Or I thought it was Vera, but I thought you were cute at first. I thought, Vera, were you planning on going first? I thought that's how we had it, but I don't know whose talk we have queued up. Let me come look. Okay, so Vera, you're first. So um, we just heard Vera speak and, and heard her introduced, but I'll recap that um, Vera Krishik is on the faculty of the University of Minnesota in the Entomology de uh, Department in the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resources. Vera got her PhD from the University of Maryland and um, continues a postdoc at the New York Botanical Gardens. Since 1998, Vera has been the director of the Sustainable Urban Ecosystems and promotes sustainable agriculture and conservation of beneficial insects. Precursor. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was just working. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Okay. So it doesn't amplify? Oh, it does if you go really here. close. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you for being interested in this topic. I'm very concerned about the decrease in biodiversity and what we can do at all different landscape scales to prevent the decline. And so I'm hoping all of you go back to your groups or organizations or join an organization and can get involved in uh, working to preserve um, biodiversity. I don't know if any of you noticed the birds. I'm a big time birder and the birds are way down this year. Way, way down. I came to Minnesota 25 years ago, and every spring around March, end of March, I would get about 50 grackles and cowbirds. They would be all over my backyard. Uh, this year I have one grackle, no cowbirds. So I'm really stunned on how clear it is to me. They say 60% decline in birds, but I'm really seeing it now in Minnesota, and that's really very tragic. So from this morning's talk, do we have something we want to talk about before I get to my second talk? Is there something that you want to reconcile that you heard about, talk about, uh, feedback? Yeah. Resolution passed, and there's key provisions in there that apply to homeowners. Actually, the city of Minneapolis urges homeowners not to use pesticides. Um, to avoid plants that are treated with systemics. It urges um, businesses not to sell pesticides, to discontinue selling, and it urges homeowners to switch to organic, non-chemical means of uh, landscaping and lawns. So um, I wanted to talk with you about that since your last message was about, you know, the urban risks to bees with neonics are worse than in the agricultural areas. So um, we really need to... Um, hold the city responsible for its pollinator-friendly policy because it is not being enacted. And what I mean by that is no neighbors I have met know about it. They did one press release, and that was it. 
So the mayor is going to be here later, isn't she? Sorry? The mayor is going to be here in a little bit. Well, that's fine. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean you can to talk to her. Right? I mean, rhetoric's not going to help. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's lip service. And so I'm really pleased because we were really thrilled to work with Cam Gordon to get this unanimously passed resolution. But if it's just rhetoric and they think they've done what they're supposed to do and haven't used all the available communication channels to inform the public, it doesn't mean anything. So I really need your help with that. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, you should work with these NGOs on getting it out to the public at farmers markets, at different events, um, through media. Um, I think people are very interested in changing their management to preserve biodiversity. Well, I think this, the city of Minneapolis is progressive. Didn't they allow bees, you know, f they allowed um, consumers to have beehives? 2009. So I think they have been doing some things, right? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to continue along um, with what I started this morning. And I want to talk a little bit more about honeybees now, since we kind of neglected that. And I said this morning that I wanted to talk about why I think the data is that um, honeybees are at a different level of responding to neonics, and maybe that's some of our problems when we have a dialogue about seed treatments affecting honeybees. And I'm going to ask you to talk more about seed treatments affecting native bees, bumblebees, ground nesting bees, because there's some pretty good data that it affects those more than honeybees. Um, remember, honeybees are managed bees. They're a commodity. Doesn't make them any less important, but they have a different life history than our native insects. So when we talk about honeybees and bees in general, um, we come up with something like this. This is Venn diagrams of all the different stresses that bees have. Um, it can be not good food, whatever good food is defined as. I don't think we know what that means yet. Fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, antibiotics used in the hive. Um, some of the new reports are coming up with, there's two new papers that say the highest frequency detected in the environment are the mosquito abatement pyrethroids and DEET. And you have to say, where is this DEET coming from? Because um, you don't usually spray DEET in the environment. It's usually just put on people. And so um, that is kind of amazing to all of us who do this residue work. So it's not um, an issue that there is decline of native pollinators uh, due to all these different factors, pathogens. You add that in there. Um, we had some practices where we were selling bees that had, selling bumblebee colonies that had native patho that had pathogens in them. And now we know that varroa mite and pathogens can spread by getting on flowers. And so different um, species going to flowers can get cross-contaminated. Maybe not with that, the same virus, but they can get cross-contaminated with viruses and pathogens that affect them. So I tend to focus on the neonicotinoids. But when we talk about honeybees, I want you to be very aware that there's many factors involved in honeybee decline, not one factor. And then those factors can act synergistically. So here is another slide, and it's talking about, um, it's taking that other slide and putting words to it. So we have beekeeper practices. We have acaricides, things in the hive to kill varroa mite, um, beneficial microbes. Um, we have pesticides, farmer practices, food availability, climate, and these pathogens. So although I speak only about neonics, it doesn't mean that there are other causal factors, but we're trying to sort out what we can change in our management. So clearly, habitat fragmentation is a big issue. Amount of habitat, restoring habitat with bee food is a big issue. I'm not going to deny that. Um, but there's a lot of papers coming out lately that are talking about the synergistic or additive effects of different pesticides on bee health. So probably all of you have seen this. When I did this slideshow, I didn't realize I'd know so many of you. But so we can get, get ahead a little bit here. But um, this is the data that there is a problem with bees. Um, what is it for Minnesota there? We have 51% in 2015 um, hive 
um, deaths, total annual loss. Those of you who are beekeepers here know this is really underestimated because now beekeepers keep having to split hives to make new hives and create new ones. And maybe some of you in the audience could talk to us a little bit about this, well, whether you think this slide is valid or it's underestimating the amount of bee loss. I've heard a lot of people think it's underestimating it. One of the big things that's going on is this winter loss. And when we did experiments, when I did experiments at the U with the honeybee people, um, our colonies all died, even our controls, over the winter. They were fine in the fall, but by the spring they were dead uh, in the controls. And so the question is, what, what are we not, t um, what parameters are we not measuring that, that that is happening? So there's something unknown still going on. So even though in an experiment I have a control, it gets no exposure to a neonic, they're not surviving the winter, so there's something else going on. And so most people um, assume that that's... So here we have this slide here, and it talks about these winter losses. And you can see winter losses are pretty high there with total annual losses, and the, the grayish color is acceptable losses. So we not only have total bee losses, but we have this winter loss. And I think we need to do more research, try to center more on what's causing that. I think it's true that varroa mite, from all the papers I read, because it vectors all these viruses, that there is some kind of synergistic additive effect with management practices, um, with virus outbreak, um, with varroa mite. And that may be what's going on with winter loss. And I'm interested in some of you beekeepers talking to me about that, whether you think that is an issue. So I guess what I'm trying to explain is that the neonics have a role in much more, I think, native bee decline than honeybee decline. Um, but because in honeybee decline, as it is a managed species, um, I think there are m other things going on. I think this whole virus issue is, the virus fungal issue is very important. And there may be a synergistic effect with pesticides affecting the immune system. So I think that really is an area of more research. So we talked this morning about systemics. The reason why systemics are much more of a problem is because they get into pollen and nectar. And my data says from um, doing greenhouse studies where I put it in plants, like these bedding plants you're going to buy. Um, it's in them at five and 10 weeks. So when a grower would sell them at 10 weeks, they're still full of insecticide at levels to kill bees. So we have the Minnesota bee laws to deal with that. And I think that was really uh, extremely um, good. I think we're probably one of the few country, few states right now and countries that have that kind of uh, law about when you propagate bee-friendly plants, you're not supposed to use systemic insecticides. So I think that's really good. My work on the environmental contamination from neonics uh, at one single dose, you're going to be very surprised it's very low. So if you use a neonic one time um, on a Asclepias plant or a milkweed or a cat mint or something, the res I've done it two years in a row. I was kind of stunned myself, but the residue is extremely low. It's the fact that you can use it every three weeks that it gets additive and keeps increasing. So I think greenhouse use, woody plant use, um, and turf use are probably where, that's where you're adding the high milli highest milligrams per square foot. And I think that's ending up with the most residue. So I think that is the part of this neonic issue that is quantifiable. <laughs> the more you put in the ground, the more you're going to get picked up by the plant and the longer it's going to happen. But when you talk to Bayer about this, and um, I mentioned Bayer because uh, they started with imidacloprid, but other chemical companies, Valiant, other ones make uh, systemic neonicotinoids. They say they've had a great deal of problem modeling it, how much you put in, how much gets into pollen nectar, how much gets in leaves. And from my own research, I, I realize that's true now. It, every plant, depending on how fast it adds biomass, so if a neonic is in a plant and you add biomass, it's going to dilute it. So something um, that grows very quickly is going to have less neonic in the flowers than something that's slower growing. So something like a composite, which is a head full of multiple flowers. And so those ray flowers are specialized florets but the flower itself is full of many flowers or florets that open and close every day. We don't perceive it as 
a head full of a thousand flowers, we perceive it as one flower, but the word composite means the head is a composite of many, many flowers. Since they sit there for a long time, I have a feeling that they're going to accumulate much faster than something like a salvia or something that's a, a simple flower. So why am I saying this? I'm saying it is really hard to model after all this work I've done, other people have done, um, to actually model what you put in the plant, how much is expressed because of the different growth forms. Um, so, but the bottom line is the more you add, the more you're going to get in pollen and nectar, and there are much higher rates. So in this Minnesota um, bee-friendly plant law, it's not just the neonics that can't be used on plants advertise as bee-friendly. It's systemics. And in my earlier talk, I said if you wanted to do something to harm beneficial insects, it would be a systemic insecticide. Because contact insecticides are, um, when the EPA registers, they're made to biodegrade in a, in a week, in three weeks. I mean, that's part of what the chemical companies do when they register them, is the idea that you use them and then they degrade, and consequently you have to spray like we heard about potatoes every five days. The neonics, because you put them in the soil and they're prevented, prevented from degradating by UVB light, and because they um, then only 90% initially gets in the plant, and slowly it's released into the plant, you have a much more longer duration. And so the big issue, always is, is what is at a field relevant dose? What is the OD50 of your target insect? And how much is delivered in pollen and nectar for what duration? What is the total risk? And I have to say, after 20 years of research, we're, we're making progress, but we really don't have that answer yet because the, there's so many different labels for the neonics with so many different usage patterns and so many different milligrams added that it's really hard to make a blanket statement that we all want to have. So when I started to do this work, I made sure Bayer and the different chemical companies were invited to my workshops. And I would get up, and I got money from Bayer for 10 years to look at some of their products. And I always said to them, well, I'm looking at the non-target effects of your products, because I'm suspicious it gets into flowers. And back when my work started um, with the Minnesota beekeepers over developing new methods for um, cottonwood trees to prevent bees from being exposed to pesticides when they were airily treating cottonwood trees. I said to use neonicotinoids because they were systemic and as the canopy fills in in a cottonwood field, you don't get volunteer flowers and so you're not going to have this whole problem. And so instead of spraying aerially, uh, it was a very good, good thing for co cottonwood trees um, in cottonwood plantations. But um, when you're using it in crops like watermelons that have tremendous root area, that the rates are high. Um, there's one good paper out there on pumpkins, one on squash, that talk about residue, and it's really in very high levels. So I just want you to know that these systemics are covered by the Minnesota bee labeling laws. Um, I'm not convinced all of them sh can be should be on there. I'm doing some work on some of them. but. Um, when you put a toxin into a plant, it's a good way of preventing it from degrading. So we have here uh, what is the principles of IPM. IPM says you shouldn't use prophylactic treatments, and these systemics are prophylactic. And that's probably one of my big problems with it. The same thing with using seed treatments prophylactically. Um, that, is one that is the way that we create resistance. If you put something on a crop all the time, no matter what the insect pressure, the insects that are tolerant, the pest insects tolerant, are going to increase in numbers. So from that perspective, I think seed-treated crops should be by prescription because um, they're violating the principles of IPM and being prophylactic rather than based on need. So um, I don't have much time here. I've kind of been talking off the cuff to you. I think you have all seen these kind of things. And I wanted to get back to you about, I wanted to talk a little bit about what data we have from the field. So there is a recent paper that just came out, and it um, is by Krupke. And he has on there the different levels in the aquatic benchmarks for the European Food Safety Authority and the EPA. And they're really, the EPA is tremendously high compared to the uh, EPA. Also, uh, Francisco Sanchez-Bio works in this area of aquatics. Is Michelle here? <laughs> 
Michelle Hadelik? Huh? Oh, she's talking someplace else. So um, there is a problem then with seed-treated crops by using it prophylactically and it getting into soil. Um, there's some really good data that Michelle Hadlick has that it's getting into surface water. And it's kind of interesting in Minnesota, we don't find it in surface water, um, even though we have this your high use of 90% of corn or 100% of corn, up and up, 70% of soybeans use seed treatments. But in Iowa and um, Maryland, it's showing up in, and in Saskatchewan where Michelle works, it's showing up in high levels. So one of, well, I just want to end by saying that there is data out there that I, get, I bump into that says that there is a risk from neonics. So let's now, beyond the science where I've kind of defined for you, it's very hard because of the different usage patterns, the different growth rate of plants, to actually come up with models that can predict risk. I want to say that there is data out there that risk is occurring. In 2009, there's this incident in um, what Wilmington Dell, and this is what our EPA uses. So we don't have the same precautionary principle that the EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, uses, but we have this um, incident reporting. So you can go to a website and fill out a form. And we do have back all the way in 2009 on a golf course in Delaware, they used a um, surface drench of metacloprid and they had a huge bumblebee kill. This is way before the bumblebee kill in, north, in the Pacific Northwest. So that indicates that there was too high a, uh, a risk from the amount of pesticide that was used. I also um, talked to people up in Maine and they said that hanging baskets, they often get complaints that it's killing bumblebees in, in nurseries. And so then again, that's an incident report. There was a report from a zoo, a butterfly garden, I have two minutes, from a butterfly garden that when they, you know, they go through all this inordinate procedure to rear these tropical butterflies and release them in hoop houses, basically. And when the butterflies were feeding on these plants, they were dying. So they were fine up to the point they hatched and when they started feeding. And then for me, this, it, this paper is really important. Um, West in 2015 was looking at um, water in California. So you're going to have high urban pesticide accumulation in California because there's not that much surface water. And the metacloprid, remember, is mostly um, a homeowner use. It's not that much on seed-treated crops anymore. So it says urban creeks waters reached maximum concentrations of 9.9 .9, um, nanograms per liter of bifentrin, 27 uh, fipronil, 12 ppbs of the metabolite, um, 1,500 ppbs of metacloprid, and these um, caused mortality of different classes of insects and crustaceans in the water, and so that's pretty significant. So even though I'm a scientist, I'm here trying to quantify and model this, I can say that there are incidence reports out there that in urban areas, usage is, is causing problems. So that's my story. I was going to tell you a little bit about honeybees, and maybe I'll just use one quick slide there. Um, so in blue is bumblebees, and black is honeybees. And the reason why I think this data for honeybees isn't as strong as native bees is because honeybees, you never have the queen foraging. So bumblebees, spring and fall, you can have a major impact if there's a risk of bumping into an insecticide. Bumblebee colonies only have 30 workers. Honeybees have 50,000. Foraging is at the end of the pipeline. Um, so if a forager disappears, it's not a real risk to the colony. But in a bumblebee, a forager forages for the whole summer. And bumblebees don't make this bee bread. They feed their larvae pollen and nectar that is not um, basically fermented or bio-fermented whereas honeybees make this bee bread where the chemicals are detoxified. So I think there's some really clear reasons why we see in the native bees m many more effects of field rates on colonies than we do at the honeybees. Thanks. Any questions? Um, can, we, can we hold on questions until all the speakers speak? Because otherwise I'm worried we'll have so many questions we won't have time to get through the talks.
and Maggie might be addressing some of the issues that you might ask Vera. So let's march along, and then we'll have everybody, an we'll ask everybody answer questions. Okay? Thank you. Okay, so next up is Maggie Douglas, um, who's a postdoc at um, the Center for Pollinator Research at Penn State. Her research uses ecological principles to understand and improve agricultural systems with particular focus on how farming practices can conserve populations. Um, so, so I'll back up and talk about Maggie's work again. <laughs> Her research uses ecological principles to understand and improve agricultural systems with a particular focus on how farming practices can conserve populations of beneficial insects while minimizing pest populations. Her recent work characterized trends in neonic seed coatings and their non-target impacts on predatory insects. Currently, she is synthesizing national data sets on pesticides to inform pollinator conservation in agricultural landscapes. And I'm sure some of you are, are familiar with um, a paper that, that she published recently about the, the way that neonex impacts slugs um, and, and, and actually lower soybean yield. So I'm sure she'll be telling us more about that, um, but I'll let you get started. Say that um, thank you. I'm I'm excited to be here. This is my first time at this meeting, and I appreciate the invitation from Beyond Pesticides to come and get to meet all of you. Um, and just to get a sense of who's in the room, so who is from Minnesota? Okay, great. Well, that I'm excited to hear that because as someone who's been working on seed treatments for the last several years, I'm really interested in some of the developments around seed treatments that have happened recently in Minnesota. So I'm definitely curious to hear more from all of you about uh, your experience working in this area. But um, as Rella mentioned, I came into neonics through a really unlikely route. I think I'm the only person who started studying neonics uh, through slugs. And I'm actually going to do a little bit of a deep dive into that system to just provide an example of how this kind of ecological thinking that we've been talking about so far in this meeting can reveal kind of both unexpected um, negative effects of pesticides and also unexpected opportunities to design systems uh, in a more ecological way. So I want to say up front that the work I'm going to present today was almost all done uh, in collaboration with John Tooker, who's also an entomologist at Penn State. And even though I work at the Center for Pollinator Research now, I'm going to talk today about, oh, Rel has some. Closer. Oh, closer. Yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, I'm loud, so I, <laughs> I don't uh, feel the need to overly uh, amplify my voice, but I'll try and do it for the recording. So even though I work at the Center for Pollinator Research now, um, I'm going to share today, I'm going to focus on some of the other beneficial insects that we haven't talked as much about. So the system that I'm going to talk to you about is the Pennsylvania soybean food web. So as an ecologist, I tend to think of agricultural systems as food webs. And so just like any, any natural system, we can think about an agriculture in this food web at the base. Whoops. Let's see if this, I can get this to work. No. Oh, it's showing up there. It doesn't should work on the screen. That's OK. So at the base, we have, of course, our soybean plant. And then we have uh, a number of pests, both um, insects and, as I'll talk about more, uh, slugs in this system. And then we have a diversity of predators that eat those pests. And coming into graduate school in entomology, I thought I was going to be studying things with uh, six legs, but I actually ended up spending a lot of my time studying these things with no legs. Um, because it turns out that as I started hearing from farmers, farmers in Pennsylvania who are growing major row crops like corn and soybeans, 80% of them told us that their biggest challenge was slugs. And to give you a sense of what this challenge looks like, this is a mower that went through a hay field in Pennsylvania in the spring. And what you see covering this mower is a solid blanket of slugs. We call this slugmageddon sometimes in Pennsylvania. And the reason why slugs are a really challenging pest is because they're not picky eaters. They'll eat virtually any plant species, and they particularly uh, go for the young plants, which sometimes they can kill outright. So you can see there slugs uh, feeding on corn, on soybeans. Just to show you I have some skin in the game, that's a slug on some lettuce in my own garden. Um, and so as a result, you know, farmers and, and independent crop consultants like Gerard here spend a lot of their time trying to wrangle slugs. 
And the, the reality is that we don't have very many good management options against this group of pests. And so when I started working in the system, what I was really interested in was trying to understand whether there might be biological controls, predators that are present in our, in our fields that might be able to help control this problem. And in the, in the course of researching that, I kind of accidentally stumbled into this field of neonic research. And so, you know, actually, I'll, the way that I got into this research field was that I was trying to find out which beetles we have. So ground beetles are one of the most diverse groups of predators we have in our crop fields. There can be 100 species of ground beetles in a single soybean field. Which of those predators might be interested in eating slugs? And so I set up some really simple experiments in the lab where I grew some soybean plants, and then I put some slugs in with the soybean plants, and then I put some predators in with the slugs to see which predators would eat them. But I was really surprised to come back the next day and find that the slugs were all alive, but most of the beetles had died. Why was that? Well, it was because I had just grabbed the seeds that were in our lab's fridge, which, like many seeds, increasingly were treated with an insecticide. These were neonate-coated seeds. So this made me start to wonder how might neonics be affecting this system? OK, so we've already heard quite a bit from Vera about this class of insecticides. And I imagine that many people here are pretty familiar with them. But just to make sure we're on the same page, this class of insecticides were introduced in the early 1990s. They have very many registered uses. I think at this point, it's over 500 registered uses in the United States. But they weren't introduced into field crops like corn and soybeans until the mid-2000s. And these are insecticides that act on the insect nervous system. They work by binding to acetylcholine receptors. So this interferes with the, um, the information transmission uh, in the nervous system. And one thing that I do think is important to point out is that these products, at least as far as we know, are less toxic to mammals than some older classes of insecticides like organophosphates. And this is one of the things that caused these products to come so quickly onto the market was that some of the registered uses were treated by EPA as reduced risk because of the potential for reduced human health risk for some of these compounds, OK? So I do think it's, it's important to kind of acknowledge that while also acknowledging that I think the body of evidence, I'm not a human toxicologist, but from what I've heard from people who are, the body of evidence we have on that point is relatively limited. OK, so as Vera's already discussed, these things circulate through the plant. They're systemic. And in the case of seed treatments, we know now that when a seed is coated with a neonic, somewhere between 2 and 20% of that product gets taken up into the plant. The other 80 to 98% gets left in the soil. So it remains in the soil, or it eventually makes its way into water. OK, so that means that this soil ecosystem is likely to be an area where we would predict that we would have some effects of these compounds. OK, and when used in these systems, like corn and soybeans, these things are targeting early season insect pests, things like the corn seed maggot you see on the left there, or the bean leaf beetle on the right. And the thing to know about these pests is that, in general, the pests that are controlled by these products are fairly sporadic in these systems. They're not the type of pests that are going to arrive um, consistently year after year. And so how might these products affect slugs? Well, I was really interested to, to discover that actually Rachel Carson noticed in, her, in Silent Spring, she said, for some reason, snail-like mollusks seem to be almost immune to the effects of insecticides. I thought it was pretty astonishing that she made this observation, you know, decades ago. And she noticed this because she was looking at research on the effects of insecticides that were sprayed on salt marshes for mosquito control. And in those marshes, they had tremendous outbreaks of snails. So this is a very different system, but has a similar kind of dynamic in the terms of biological communities that exist. So what effect do neonics have um, on these uh, slugs in corn and soybeans? Well, I did a really simple experiment where I enclosed slugs with uh, soybean seeds that either had uh, no treatment on them, or only fungicides, or a fungicide and an insecticide. And what you see in this graph is the percentage of seedlings that were attacked over time. And from the perspective of a slug, they could not care less whether the neonic was there. They're not susceptible to these compounds. OK. But what I did next was I took the slugs that had been feeding on these plants, and then I took those slugs and I fed them to some of the beetles and found out what happened then. And what happened was that the beetles that fed on the slugs from the untreated or fungicide-only soybean plants were normal, and the ones that fed on these insecticide-treated uh, soybean plants transmitted some of that compound to the predators. 
And so as a result, over half of the beetles that were eating these slugs were either impaired or dead. So what does it mean to say that they were impaired? Well, here's where I think a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is what a normal one of these beetles looks like. This is Clanius tricolor. It's one of my favorite ground beetles. And you can see that it's very kind of quick and spry. And then, let's see. Here you can see one of the beetles after it's fed upon one of these slugs that's been eating neonic treated soybean seedlings. So sometimes we say, you know, this is your brain on slugs. This is, these are, <laughs> got a few laughs from people of my generation in the audience, I appreciate that. So these are the symptoms that we would expect for a neurotoxin if it were moving through the food chain. We see that these beetles are um, very slow, they're, they have difficulty flipping themselves back over when they're flipped on their backs. And you can imagine that a beetle in its natural environment, these beetles have their own enemies. And so this would be uh, very susceptible to predation from other creatures. Okay, so we found these interesting results in the lab, but do they actually matter in the field? Well, I did a simple uh, field experiment in soybeans in 2012, just comparing uh, plots that were treated with untreated soybeans and plots with uh, neonic and fungicides on them and measuring um, you know, what happened to the plants, to the slugs, to the beetles, and then also taking samples of these uh, different parts of the food web to understand how the insecticide was flowing through it. And so we predicted, on the basis of these lab results, we predicted that where the seed treatment was used that we would have fewer predators, and that would actually lead to an increase in slugs, and ultimately more damage to the plants, and actually less soybean yield. And in fact, that's pretty much exactly what we found. So we found that during the early season, we found about 30% fewer predators in these plots where neonics were used, and also a 30% decrease in the actual predation activity of that community of predators. And that led to a 67% increase in the abundance of slugs in these plots, and ultimately about 20% fewer soybean plants and 5% lower yield. So this is just an example of how understanding these complex biological communities can lead to these unexpected surprising effects. So, you know, the assumption, as we've heard about in several presentations this morning, is that these products have a benefit within the systems that they're used. But we found that actually, in some cases, they can have, they can have a cost even within those systems. Okay. When it comes to how neonics are moving in the food chain, there were kind of good news and bad news in these outcomes. Now, many people, when they think about pesticides and food chains, they immediately think about biomagnification. And what biomagnification would look like is that you would have the lowest concentration at the bottom of the food chain, and as you move up the food chain, the concentration of the, the pesticide would increase. But that's actually not what we found. We found the opposite of that. So we found that neonics were actually biodiluting through the food chain. So the highest concentrations were found at the base of the food chain in these soybeans, and then as you move up to slugs and up to beetles, you see the concentration reducing. So this is good news, because this, it would be worse if neonics were concentrating at the food chain. However, the bad news is that the concentrations, even though they're decreasing, the concentrations in these slugs are still quite high, and certainly high enough to be biologically meaningful. So what we found is that these slugs in these neonic-treated fields are roaming around with about 13 nanograms of neonics per slug. So a predator that eats that would be getting that dose. And as Vera pointed out, um, the LD50 for a honeybee is somewhere in the 3 to 5 nanogram range. Many of the predators that we have are about the same size as a honeybee. So these are still concentrations that are very concerning. And in some um, additional sampling that we did in some of these plots, we found that it wasn't showing up only in slugs, but it was also showing up in earthworms and in cutworm caterpillars that are existing in those same environments. Okay, so we did this field experiment. We found that we could see this surprising decrease in yield as a result of these products, but how unusual are these results? Was it just one weird finding? You know, as a scientist, we're always concerned about the gen generalizability of our results. So I just want to share a little bit to help put these results in context. Um, to the larger question of whether or not neonics improve yield more generally in Pennsylvania, um, myself and John Tucker and Marion Legall, who's pictured here, have done a series of experiments in both corn and soybeans over the past few years. And in corn, we've found from two research station uh, trials and three on-farm studies, no difference in yield. In soybeans, um, in addition to the results I already shared with you where we found a decrease in yield, we had two more uh, years of results where there was no difference in yield. 
There were also three on-farm studies where at two out of the three sites, there was no difference in yield. The third site, these results are still in progress, but at the third site, there was definitely not an improvement in yield. If anything, there might have been a decrease in yield again. So we're seeing that benefits from these products are elusive, at least in the conditions in our systems in Pennsylvania. Okay, so how about natural enemies? You know, putting aside, I looked at this one group, um, natural enemies in this one system in Pennsylvania, but what about, um, is it more generally, is there a consistent negative effect of these neonic seed treatments on natural enemies? And are neonics more or less harmful than some of the alternative insecticides? Now, this is an important question, and something that I get from farmers a lot is, you know, there's this perception that seed treatments are more targeted, that they should reduce the effects on beneficial insects compared to something like a pyrethroid spray or a, so or a um, granular soil applied insecticide. So we used a technique called meta-analysis. What that means is that we went out and we collected all the field studies we could find in the scientific literature from North America and Europe. And then we um, used some statistical techniques to standardize the results from all of those studies and combine them using a method called meta-regression. And what we found, we, found, we did two kinds of comparisons. One were um, field studies that looked at neonics compared with plots that had no insecticide. And we found 20 studies like that that covered 56 site years and had over 600 observations. Because many studies uh, measured the effects on many different organisms in the same study. We also looked at, found studies that compared neonics to pyrethroid, either spray or soil applied. And there were eight studies like that with uh, over 300 observations. So what did we find? Well, here, sorry. <laughs> we found that in this graph, the, the x-axis there is showing the change in natural enemy abundance that we found when we made these comparisons. And in the top row, what you see is the difference between plots with neonics and plots with no insecticide. And the bar is showing you the mean difference between those comparisons. So we found that on average, neonics were reducing natural enemy abundance by about 16% compared to plots where no insecticide was used. I would argue that that's a modest effect, but it was consistent across of our studies. It was statistically significant. When we compared neonics to pyrethroids, there was a lot more variability among the studies. And I think that we could actually use more studies in that area to get a better understanding of what that comparison looks like. But we did find that of the eight studies, there was one that was very different than the other studies. And when we took that one out, then the results um, became far less variable. But in both cases, we found no significant difference between the effects of neonics and pyrethroids on natural enemies. OK, so shifting gears a little bit, um, one thing as I got into this research area that I noticed is that it was hard to get just kind of basic information about how much do we really know about these neonics, especially the seed treatments, how, where, and why they're used. OK, so there are a whole series of questions that we might want to ask. And sort of naively, when I got into this, I thought, surely there must be some government website that just tracks all of this information, right? And you all are laughing because you're wiser than I, than I was, I think. But, you know, so the answer is no. There's not exactly one government website that tracks all of this information, especially for seed treatments. Um, and in fact, there, there are kind of two really important sources of data on pesticide use in the United States. Um, USGS has a more recent um, pesticide reporting effort that some of you maybe have explored their website. And they, they track actually over 400 different pesticide products, but including the neonics. And USDA also has a farmer survey on pesticide use. But importantly, the USDA survey explicitly excludes seed treatments. So seed treatments are not in that data set. Um, I will say that they're changing that. So in 2016, the 2016 corn survey did have a question about seed treatment. So I think that's a step in the right direction. But by pulling uh, together some of these various data sets and combining it with information from pesticide labels and doing some simple math, I don't think I use E equals MC squared, but whatever, uh, we were able to derive some estimates for some of these uh, questions that we might want to know. And interestingly, Minnesota is one of the only states that I was able to find in the United States that has data on pesticide sales. It's really interesting. And so we're interested in, you know, how much does agriculture versus maybe home use or, or turf use or some of these things contribute to total neonic use. And in Minnesota, at least, the, the data suggests that most of the use is used on crops. <laughs> 
I think that may be, you know, this is not to um, take away from Vera's point that the rates that are being used in urban environments are often much higher, but there's just so much agricultural land that even if they're used at lower rates, it tends to swamp the overall use. And then using the USGS data, we were able to look at how it breaks down by crop. Okay, so we found virtually all neonics seem to be used on crops, but I will say that's based only on Minnesota data, so we don't know how, how generalizable that is. And corn and soybean by far dominate the amount that is used. Virtually all of that is used as seed treatments. And we estimated that as of 2011, somewhere between 79 and 100% of the corn acres in the US uh, were treated, and 34 to 44% of the soybeans were treated. And now it's no doubt higher than those estimates. So just to put that in perspective, that's a si the area that's treated is a land area the size of California. It's, it's quite a large land area. Just to give you an update, so some recent uh, data was just released, and just between 2011 and 2014, neonic use has increased again by 50%. And in corn, it's actually doubled over that period. Now in corn, already almost 100% of the acres were being treated, so how could it go up still further? Well, the reason is because the rates being used on the seed are increasing. Okay, so the conclusions out of this paper, and I don't have time to go into all of the, the um, we, we reviewed a lot of literature in that paper, but our conclusions were that neonics, to some extent, have fallen through the cracks of government surveys on pesticides. And I think it's really important that we have valid data on the trends in the use of these things to understand them, but I think it is starting to be corrected. And a lot, the, you know, the lion's share of the use is seed treatments in corn and soybean in terms of quantity applied. That doesn't necessarily mean in terms of their effects on beneficials. I think it's really important to understand that in the case of seed treatments, it is seed dealers and not farmers that are applying these products, okay? And the pesticide label actually does not travel to the farmer. That's a really important point. And it's part of a larger technology package that includes, it's not just that insecticide, but it's an insecticide, often several fungicides, and nematicide, transgenic traits, they're all packaged together in this, with the seed. The good news is that with integrated pest management, it appears that we could reduce the use of these products quite considerably without reducing yield. And by doing that, we could also reduce the associated effects on beneficial insects. So I just wanna, I wanna conclude by giving you kind of a hopeful note here, just in returning to this soybean system, what would this kind of more ecologically based integrated pest management system look like? And I wanna give you this example. So Lucas, who I've been showing all along here, is a farmer in Union County, Pennsylvania. And he made this interesting observation about the slugs that in the springtime, the, the fields where uh, you know, you're planting corn, for example, look, they typically look like this. They're clean fields where the only thing is growing is the corn. And that means the slugs only have one thing to eat, which is the corn. So Lucas thought, well, what if I put something else in between the rows and give the slugs something alternative to eat? So he's kind of using this ecological thinking. And that's exactly what he did. So Lucas is a big cover crops adopter, and he's, he and some other farmers in the area have adopted this, uh, developed this system called, that they call planting green, where in this case he used a rye cover crop that instead of killing it before he planted the corn, he rolled it down at planting time and planted his corn um, in between these strips of, of living rye. And then as the corn is coming up, the slugs feed on that rye instead of feeding on the corn. And actually, so he did some uh, experiments on his farm together with John and they confirmed that that was the case. So Lucas has been doing this. He's, he's implementing this on his farm. So are some of the other farmers in this area. He stopped using seed treatments to conserve the predators and he's using these cover crops as a slug management technique. And so far he's finding similar yields. He's reduced his insecticide cost. He estimates by about $3,600 a year. He's also reduced his herbicide cost by over $5,000 a year because it turns out that that mat of cover crop provides really good weed control. So again, this kind of systems thinking, right? But one challenge here is that he has a really hard time finding high quality seed without neonics, right? So this is one reason I'm really interested in this Minnesota experiment because I'm curious as, these, um, as the state government implements this new plan, what's gonna happen with the availability of neonic free seed. Okay, and that's all I have, which is good because my time is up, and I look forward to talking to people more.
Thanks. It's, it's interesting as the whole picture is coming together, isn't it? Okay, so most of the public gets their information from people like Josephine, <laughs> who thank goodness we have some reporters out there who are talking to the scientists, getting the real information and reporting it accurately. Um, so Josephine McCarty um, writes about nature and the environment for the Star Tribune here in Minneapolis. And she started working there in 1979, and she's also worked as a business yeah. reporter, medical reporter, and health and science editor. As an environmental reporter, she's won national awards um, for the series Bees on the Brink and for beat reporting. And she also writes about agriculture, mining, um, and most of all, water in the land of 10,000 lakes. <laughs> so go ahead, Josephine. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Uh, one of the things I wanted to finish with what Maggie was saying about uh, the cover crops um, is that the, uh, I believe that the um, crop insurance programs are, do not work, are, not, uh, are not, not beneficial to farmers if uh, they use cover crops. They have to kill the cover crops before they plant their corn in order to get crop insurance. One of the great little loops in our systems. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, if you can hang on a second, I got to try to call up my. Uh, I don't have slides um, because the stories I do don't lend themselves to slides, but I'm hoping I can um, find what I need on our website. Uh, I'm gonna have to put down the mic for a second. I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm gonna subject you to some ads. But don't worry, because that's what pays my salary, okay? Let's remember that. <laughs> Hang on, I gotta put this down. Let's see if this works. So um, I'm a newspaper reporter. I've been at the Star Tribune since 1979. And I'd like to tell the people, the young kids who come there now, that I've been there longer than they've been alive. Um, so I started out as a business reporter, and I covered economics and uh, transportation and uh, the food companies. Um, and then for many years, I was a medical reporter, and I did a lot of stories on transplant medicine and mental health, um, public health, uh, reproductive health. And then um, more recently, I've been, uh, for the last six, seven years, I've been an environmental reporter. And what they, all, what they all have in common is that I like complex topics. So I became an environmental reporter sort of by happenstance. I went into my editor's office and said, um, with a newspaper from Duluth with a big story in it about polymet mine. And I said, you know, we really need to be covering this story because we weren't covering it at all. And then he, had this, he got this little look in his eye, like uh, the little light went off, and he said, would you? And I said, you know, I would be. <laughs> it was like one of those, you know, psychologists talk about the click, you know, when people fall in love and out of love. It was kind of a click moment. Um, so why did he want me to do this? What was it that I sort of brought to this? So a lot of envir environmental reporting is a lot like um, covering regulation covering politics, covering you know, legislation, um, and it can be kind of uh, dry. And this Tribune is a, the Star Tribune is a very successful regional newspaper. It's one of the most successful in the country. And one reason for that is because we write about Minnesota as a unique place. And what he was, what he was looking for was someone who could write about the environment in a way um, that Minnesotans actually experience in Minnesota. So I don't write about climate change, like as a global problem. I write about how climate change affects the boreal forest in northeast Minnesota and the people who live there and who, have to see, and who see these changes coming. I try to make it personal. So the first story I did on the beat, um, I could have written a long, complicated, process-oriented story about mining and a regulatory standard called sulfate. But instead, I wrote a story that started like this. In the fight over proposed mining projects in northern Minnesota, a new player with, with a surprising amount of clout has emerged, wild rice. This month, a routine state review of a state water quality standard that has lain largely dormant for three decades 
erupted into an intensely emotional debate about how to protect the state's most iconic plant. So would you rather read about the sulfate standard or would you rather read about wild rice? Now that, I mean, wild rice is a quintessential American, I mean, Minnesota plant. It's something we all are fond of and kind of identify with. And it's really, Minnesota is really the only place in the world where it grows with any abundance whatsoever. So I do other stories too. I do the regulatory stuff, but I try to keep those to a minimum. Um, so then I got, uh, in 2012, I got a, a press release from the Center for Food Safety about a legal action filed by, bee keep, by, uh, by beekeepers in Minnesota and others across the country um, filed against the EPA, and two of, these guys, two of them were from Minnesota. So um, that was interesting that, you know, we have these beekeepers from Minnesota taking on the EPA, and I knew nothing about neo, ne how do you pronounce them? <laughs> So uh, I called up uh, Steve Ellis, one of the beekeepers, and he told me what was you know, his life experiences. And I wrote a story that started like this. In a spring ritual as old as life itself, Steve Ellis's bees return to their hives day after day, loaded with pollen from the dandelions and flowering trees that are in full bloom across central Minnesota. But for too many of them, a day of foraging ends in convulsions and death. So this is what sort of started me off on the whole uh, you know, bee road. Um, so um, that's sort of, that was my first introduction to colony collapse disorder. But the fundamental question that, you know, that story presented in my mind was, like everyone else, is why are we losing bees? And that's kind of what led to this story. Hang on a minute, if I can find it. Oh, this is taking too long. Oh, sorry. Anyways, I did a big project on um, uh, this transformation of um, our landscape where we had lost all of our prairies and turned it into corn. Um, and that was sort of the first big environmental project that I did. Um, and it was sort of my classic kind of thing where I took a gin ginormous uh, topic which included big landscape, corn prices, GMO, uh, glyphosate, global commodity prices, and federal ag support programs and turned them into a story about um, um, how our landscape has changed. So, um, and that one started with, and what I always look for in these cases is s characters. Who are the people? And this one started with Bruce Roseland. Bruce Roseland runs, a, uh, runs cattle here in the heart of South Dakota grasslands, in the same place where his great-grandfather ranched more than 100 years ago. But today, when he looks out his kitchen window, the prairie that once reached from horizon to horizon is gone, Instead, he sees neat rows of corn marching up to the edge of the blue sky, growing where not too long ago it never grew at all. Did we ask the Indians permission to come out here and destroy their way of life? Said Rosalind, who will be the last of the men in his family with the gnarled hands of a rancher. Well, that's what's happening to us, except it's technology. And there were um, a lot of other characters in there. Um, when you have one character that tells one side of the story, I have a character who tells the other side of the story. So in this case, these were the Hefty Brothers. Um, they are big uh, ag producers and suppliers up in uh, South Dakota and North Dakota. The Hefty Brothers are widely known among Midwestern farmers as the blonde and jovial hosts of Ag PhD, a folksy cable TV show where they teach all the latest farming techniques and technology. Their annual farm fest are hundreds of workshops on topics like pattern tile drainage and navigating wetland protection rules. In making a case for modern agriculture, Hefty shows a serious side that his TV fans don't always see. He also illuminates the deep philosophical divide between agriculture and conservation. Productive land, he said, is an, important, is, is an improvement over land in its natural state. Don't tell us what we have to do with our land, he said. We are trying to make it better. And there is the whole world out there that believes that, and they, and they live it. So um, I'm gonna try one more time to pull this up. 
Oh, I'm sorry, it's not showing up. I might need two hands. <laughs> and one of the reasons why I want to do that is because, um, you know, I'm only half the uh, show here. Um, The other half of the show are the photographers I work with. And um, well, it showed up on my computer when I was doing this. Because um, I work with a photographer on that story, uh, Renee Jones, who did some fabulous um, photography on the prairies and the, sort of the contrast between croplands and prairies and the people that we were writing about. I'll do it on Google. Okay, and yeah, it's a big file. Um, at the same time, the, one of the reasons why that story was also timely is because the state was in the process of launching a prairie preservation plan. Um, now I get land, <laughs> snow removal. <laughs> Here we go. Dun, 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 dun. So this was the Hefty Brothers. Um, this was one of their farm fests where they were showing people um, uh, sort of how to lay pattern tile. And it wasn't really, um, it was already a plowed field, but you get, you get the general idea. Um, so my job with photographers is, is to put them in the right place in the right time with the right people and the subjects that fit the story. And um, where did it happen? I'm still loading it. I think we're going to go to the next one anyway. So some of you may have seen this one. This was a story that we I did um, uh, after plowing away the prairies. And again, this was um, more or less uh, inspired by Steve Ellis and uh, his partner, um, Jeff Anderson. My editor, and I, my editor and I both came up with this one because we were intrigued with the idea of the gypsy beekeepers who travel back and forth across the country. And um, and again, this had a very Midwestern flavor. Minnesota was one of the is or was one of the top honey-producing states in the country. Um, the neonicotinoid neo issue is a big issue in Minnesota because we're 90% corn. And um, and in many ways, this is the same story about uh, the same story as the prairie story, just turned on its head, told from the, from the perspective of the beekeepers and the bees. Um, So the, um, again, I had the two, two characters, 
They see this unfurling crisis through entirely different prisms. Anderson, slightly round and solid as a fire plug, is a creationist who believes that God made the world and all its creatures in seven days, and that mankind was put here to take care of it. That includes using chemicals to grow food, but we should be judici judicious in how we do it. Ellis, courtly and real thin, is entranced by the evolutionary role that pollinators have played over millions of years in the creation of flower, color, and scent. Without insects, he says, the world would be a place much more like Dorothy's Kansas and the technicolor land of Oz that nature has produced. We would go back to black and white. So I love the two contrasts between those two guys and how, how different they were. This was a um, four-part series. It took me mo most of a year to do this. Um, Aaron Rupp was character in this. <laughs> um, Mac Earhart, who was another speaker here today, was a character in this. Um, and, um, and it was a big, oh, oh I'm, I'm, we better move on. Um, so it was a big um, project which had multiple parts. And the last piece of it was a profile of um, um, Marla Spivak, mostly because it was, I wanted to emphasize the idea that uh, not all is lost, that there is, all, that there is hope, but you know, in terms of the research and science that's going on. So um, I also wanted to show you some of the, um, so how do you get me to do one of these stories about something you care about? <laughs> All right, so what's the definition of news? Uh, the definition of news is something new. I won't do a story about the gypsy beekeepers again. I've done that. Um, unless there's new to say, something new to say about it. I mean, if, they, if, the, if the migration ends, if you know, they come up with a new way to pollinate the, crop, the almond crops. Um, I don't do topics or issues. I do stories that reflect topics and issues. So I need a, tre I need a trend, I need a lawsuit, I need some kind of news peg to tie it to. Um, uh, so, for example, um, Christy Allen. Some of you may know her. Um, she was also a character in the in the uh, in the bee in the bee stories. Uh, she had she was the first beekeeper in the state to actually collect damages because of uh, corn dust off. Yeah. She was the she was the a person who sort of pushed for this new law to to come into effect, and then she was the first to collect from it. Now that's a story. Um, let's see. So. What I want you to do is come to me with characters and real people who are willing to go on the record and have their picture taken. So one example of that is um, the EPA, and see here's a new, new, a new um, insecticide that I don't know how to pronounce yet, it's not new. It's chlorpyrifos, chlorpyrifos, how do we say that? Chlorpyrifos, okay. So Lex sent me a, an email this week about a push to, um, for a legislative push related to this. And uh, I'm interested in this because of what's going on with uh, the EPA and their decision to, to allow it to continue to be marketed. But I need the people who are harmed by it, not just one, but more. Um, I, you know, I need it to be in Minnesota. Um, I need it to be a circumstance in which the farm, farmer followed all the rules, so it can't be a one-off about a farmer who, you know, who you know, made a mistake. Um, I need people to go on the record and um, in general, I need those personal stories, I need the news, and I need the science. So if you can put that all together and bring me a story, I'll probably publish it. So, thanks. Okay, do, you, do you all wanna come up here so you can all answer questions? So we don't have a whole lot of time, but you know, it's, it's great to have all these people in one room together, so it's a real opportunity, and then discussion can happen over lunch. Um, but does anybody have any questions? Okay, I'm gonna go with who's closer to Lori. Okay. Um, this is for Josephine. Mm -hmm. I still how have the microphone, so you're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, how do you navigate information gathering specifically on this issue we're here for? Um, when universities are bought by pesticide companies and scientists are intimidated, how do you get the information you need? Um, well, not all universities are bought and not all scientists are intimidated. Um, so, um, you know, if 
you have to go to the scientists that are publishing in peer reviewed pu public you know peer reviewed publications and um and I do that. I talk with people like Vera. I've quoted her many times. Um, and the um, if you have information that can that can show a scientist who was intimidated by um, into silence, then give it to me. I'll write a story. I've have done those stories. Um, and in terms of the universities being bought by science, you know, I'd love to do that story if you can show it. But I can't make it up. I ha it has to be, there has to be real information there that shows that there's something different about the way it's always been. I read or heard something about honeybees possibly interfering with um, well, causing deaths of bumblebees and I'm wondering about the rusty patch and if there's any particular information about honeybees either spreading disease or because of the extensive use of the habitat, which there's so little of to start with, if you have any information about that. Yeah, so there was a problem um, about 30 years ago when they were importing bumblebee colonies from Europe and it, it brought a bacteria here. It's actually a protozoan, it's kind of a weird thing. And they think it got into our bee populations. And there's some, there's a researcher at Illinois called Cameroon. And she has a really beautiful system where she's going to answer this question of what is causing the decline of some bee species and not bumblebee species and not others. So we just have to wait like a year for her to get her data. So she has susceptible bumblebees and not. And she's trying to figure out what is going on in terms of population decline. It seems that the susceptible bees are in decline and the non-susceptible to this protozoan are at a steady rate. So I am on a federal rusty patch committee and we're working on extension like leaflets to help urban people and farmers do managements to try to protect all bumblebees because we don't think people are gonna be able to tell the difference between rusty patch and others. So there are initiatives all over trying to preserve um, bumblebees. But yes, you're right. There's documented numerous papers on the introduction of this protozoan from Europe. And then they stopped the sales. So now culprit biological has to grow the bumblebees on an American species, Bombus um, impatiens. They can't use Bombus terrestris, the European species. But you know the pathogen is already out there. So yes, that story is true, parts of it. We don't know if Rusty Patch um, was susceptible or not, but I'm sure Cameroon is gonna help sort that out for us. So you're just like a year early, but you'll get an answer soon. Thank you all, it's so good to hear from all of you. Um, I think my question is in particular for you, Maggie, but others feel free to chime in too. And I think it's two parts. So one is, yeah, here in Minnesota, we're pushing hard to get better information about the frequency of use of seed treatments and sort of what their actual use and impact on the landscape is. And I'm curious for you as a researcher, for what you're seeing, what would we understand better if we had more of that information or like what what's out there that we could learn? Um, and then the second piece is, um, you know, I think there's all of this evidence that seed treatments are being used really widely, um, even when there's not a pest problem. And then there are some situations where there are really pests that we're trying to solve for. And I'm curious, um, what do you see as like the research gaps or opportunities to really solve for specific pest problems that right now are being solved with neonics, if you if you know much about that? Um, and how can we kind of make sure resources are focused on solving actual pest problems in, a, in an IPM uh, system, as opposed to sort of the, the prophylactic use? Okay, so there was a lot Whatever there. Whatever you want. <laughs> so, I think the, Go in. so I think the first question was, you know, if we have better data about pesticides, what does that do for us? Mm -hmm. And from my perspective um, as a researcher, but I would think also for some of you, I, you know, I think it's essential that we know where we've been and where we're going to interpret these trends and changes. Because one of the questions, for example, with neonics that comes up is, okay, neonics are being really widely used, but are they displacing another insecticide that's even worse? Because if they are, then that obviously complicates the situation, right? And so having really solid data just on what farmers are using, where they're using it, and how they're using it can help us answer those kinds of questions to understand 
in what situations these things are displacing other products and when they're not. Um, so I would say that's, from my perspective, that's like that one of the reasons that's so essential. And also the work, some of the work I'm doing now that I didn't talk about today is um, I'm working on a project currently where we're trying to better characterize the spatial patterns of pesticide use in the landscape so that we can better understand how those patterns relate to bee health. And so if we can, if we know where in the landscape, like the use of, you know, very bee toxic products is most intense, and then at the same time, if we collect data on how, whether or not the bees are healthy, we can start to understand better the relationships that are going on there. Because it's, you know, as we've heard, it's very difficult to do field studies, especially on honeybees, because they travel over such large areas. So having kind of landscape level data on pesticide use would be, provide another avenue to understand that. Um, I think to your other question about uh, sort of pest management, seed treatments and pest management, um, you know, I think this is where like the land grant model really shines. You know, <laughs> you have specialists, you know, entomologists who work at the land grants over decades and really get to know the systems in that place, and and they have sort of the best handle for that place. Of, you know, they're in touch with the farmers and they understand what pests really. Um, would you expect to show up in certain situations and can provide the extension resources so that you can better predict where you would get a benefit or where you would not. So I'll just give you like one example of how like that knowledge can help. So like in, in, um, in Pennsylvania, if you, so bean leaf beetle, which is a pest I mentioned, that's a pest that actually is controlled well by neonics, like in soybeans. And, but the thing about bean leaf beetle is that it's a pest that tends to attack the earliest planted soybeans. So one of the jokes that extensionists tell is that if you don't want to get bean leaf beetle, just wait for your neighbor to plant soybeans, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> because like then, you know, they'll attack their soybeans and not your soybeans. So that means there's going to be some fraction of soybeans every year that are affected by this pest, but it's not going to be all the acres every year, right? So could you potentially focus your use of these products on the earliest planted soybeans and not on the later planted soybeans. I think there are some fairly simple approaches like that, but it's going to vary quite a lot from place to place in the farming systems and the climate and that kind of thing. So this is directed at both Josephine and you, Maggie, for your excellent presentation on slugs, and you had some predators in there, which was the beetle and it what looked like a spider. So how do we move the conversation from pollinators as just one unit to the big picture that ha has us finding people starting to see the value of those other insects in our gardens in aesthetic purposes, but also in the economic thresholds in IPM? Because it seems like we're missing the big picture of beneficial insects in the stories that are out in the media, and people still see insects as pests. Um, sure, I thought you were talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my first question, <laughs> my first question um, when this is over is to ask Maggie, do we have slugs in Minnesota? <laughs> and is it a big problem for the farmers? Uh huh. Uh huh. So where some of the so one reason why they're so bad in Pennsylvania is because like Minnesota is very widely adopted. But I'm not sure in Minnesota if it's adopted to the same extent. Vera's shaking, shaking her head. She's saying no. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't, have, if you're not doing no-till, it's likely not going to be a Okay, because. Um, if there was a way to bring your research on slugs and the efficacy or lack of efficacy on neonics in, for Minnesota farmers, that's a story I would do, because it has all the elements, which is you know that it's um, you know it tells a story about nature that um, and sort of this you know da who knew that you know um, that we're killing all the beneficial insects but then they eat the slugs, you know. So I mean that would be a good that would be a good environmental story for me, um, and you know. So if only, I mean, if it's true, I mean, I can certainly ch check into it, but you know, that's one that I would do. I have a question real quick, sorry. Um, would there be a story for you, Josephine, in your average true green applier um, that I've talked to that said, um, we don't use any products that are known to kill bees. So I've checked out what they're using when they tell me, and I've looked on the beyond pesticides, um, what is it, gateway? 
and found that, uh, for example, 2,4-D looks to be toxic to bees. Sorry, 2,4-D? Um, so yeah, is there a story in that? Because I've talked to homeowners too and they said, I thought I'd check this out when they have the sign up that says we just sprayed. So also um, concerned with pets that um, sprayers have told me, well, you can let your dog on in 24 hours, 20 minutes. Would there be a story for you in that to counteract the propaganda um, by the... Um, you know, I'd kind of need like a... Uh, if there was something new to be said about it, I mean, if there was some new research about the what they were using, um, or if there was, you know, uh, somebody went public with challenging, in a major way, challenging their claims, um, if, um, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd need a, a, a new, what we call a news hook for something like that. Um, and the fact that one sort of true green, they're just one company, and there is one guy at one company who says we don't we don't use things known to kill bees. I mean, he's parroting the he's parroting the chemical industry line, which is you know that um, you know they would they make the claim that there's no direct evidence that what they're doing you know if used appropriately kills bees, and that gets into a kind of a semantic argument one way or the other. So I need something more than that. Yeah, well, they're killing weeds. That's what they say. I know. We have time for one more. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess this is a question for um, Maggie. Um, so, like, the, the soybean farmers I work with, they use a drill. So, I mean, that's when the neonic, I mean, they tell me there's, like, neonic dust literally mm -hmm. blowing off their fields. So, I guess that's another way it gets into the environment very quickly, and that's usually when the bees are doing their most, because that's when all the flowers are falling. So, that's just one thing they always tell me. It's like, that that's how uh, we know we're definitely affecting the environment. And I was curious in your study, like, how you dealt with, if you're trying to, control, I guess, for, because, I mean, the farmers are not just using neonic seeds, they're also using Roundup, and they're, so, I mean, if you're talking about yield drag, I mean, Don Huber's here, he could tell you that Roundup alone causes a yield drag in soybeans if you add the neonic, I mean, I can see this a whole cycle, mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if, like, I heard in, um, is Ontario banned neonic? I mean, that seems like a case, that would be like an example to study what's the actual impact in Ontario mm -hmm. post-neonic ban. Mm -hmm on soybean yields versus here, if they're still using Roundup and other, th I mean, I don't know what other chemicals they're using, but I'm trying to figure out how to, since it's the synergistic effects, how you parse out just the neonic seeds versus Roundup, I mean, everything else is in the system. Right, right. I mean, I can quickly say, for my own experiments and the ones I've been involved with, the, I mean, experimentally, we controlled for that, so the only thing that was different was the neonic. So we're confident that it was connected to that and not to other things because everything else was the same. But I agree with you that I think it would be really interesting to follow both in Ontario and here in Minnesota as these things start to be reduced. Can we understand, get a better idea of the, yeah, the yield effects? I think that would be valuable. Did you have something to add? So there's a paper that just came out from Finland where they did what you're asking. And um, I don't know if you can send me an email, I'll send it to you. So, so the, the question is, um, how do you get the net effects of seed treatments on the ecology of the plant and the yield? And so there's a Finnish study that just, they banned the neonic seed treatments. And so they're looking at yield pre and post, and they don't find any difference, but they f see a resurgence in honeybees. A couple points on what's happening here in Minnesota. So uh, our Department of Ag reviewed neonicotinoid insecticides, made two recommendations to our legislature. One of them was to uh, track uh, treated seed in Minnesota. That is no longer in any legislation moving forward. Um, the governor, I guess, could add it back in, but it's not very likely to happen. So. Um, still on the list as a potential priority for Department of Ag moving forward, but they really feel like they need the legislature to approve that for them to be able to do that work, to gather that data. And then the other thing, Vera, um, with the bee-friendly uh, plant label in Minnesota in 2014, that meant that you couldn't treat um, a plant with a pollinator lethal insecticide and then label it as bee friendly. But then I think in 2015, um, it was changed to you can't label it as bee friendly if you've treated with a uh, bee lethal insecticide that is at a level that kills an adult honeybee outright when she visits a flower. 
So basically it means not very much anymore. Um, so that's where we're at now with both of those things. So it's actually the NOEL, yep. which I talked about this morning. Yep. So yes, your answer is basically, it doesn't amount to much because you saw the sublethal effects on the bumblebees. Yep. But the idea was to try to create a level of residue that you could measure, but the problem is with the EPA's poor ability to predict, um, a, rather than they just have an acute number, their poor, poor pr pr ability to pr predict sublethal effects. So y yes, you're right, but they were trying to just put a number there that wasn't toxic. So the potential is there if we have a number for a sublethal dosage at the EPA that maybe Minnesota law will change to reflect that or we'll advocate for Minnesota law to change to <laughs> reflect that. I don't know if we have time for the last one. Let's take one last one and then we'll break for lunch. I'm very curious on the next steps for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee Bureau, so if you could expand on that. Uh, what kind of what kind of process is going on? Who's part of the who's part of the rescue team? Let's say and and uh, how are citizens? How can citizens be involved in that process? Yeah, so I think they're starting to figure this out, and so I'm on one of I think there's a number of different committees. There's one that's looking at the effects of pathogens, another on habitat. I'm on the one with pesticides, and so we're trying to come up with literature to educate farmers and homeowners on what they can do in their backyard to not affect Rusty Patch. So I think right now it's at the educational level, but when something like this happens, <coughs> then it m people um, can get research money easier. And as I mentioned, this woman Cameroon in Illinois who's looking at this, um, you know, I'm hopeful her group will continue this research to sort out if it's um, pesticides or pathogens or habitat. You know, you know, rusty patch was a very common species and all of a sudden over 25 years it's just disappeared. And so it's like the canary in the mine. What is actually going on with it? I, just a, a follow up. I understand informally that they're not going to be looking at critical habitat in Minnesota. Any thoughts on that and whether or not that's going to change, change a different direction? Because since we have located Rusty Patches and Pilot Knob and in uh, Mendota Heights and uh, by the Bellwin Conservancy has identified Rusty Patches. Um, I believe um, uh, a park in Washington County has them too. So I'm just wondering to what extent that might be a step forward and how we accomplish that. So I've been, I'm on this federal committee, so I don't know the state what's going on yet. Uh, eventually I hope to, but right now I don't. But critical habitat management is always a part of endangered species management. And you're saying the DNR said not to manage? The DNR, Fish and Wildlife Service. Fish and Wildlife, okay. Well, we'll see what the DNR not, says, not right? Not always part of the endangered species uh, process yeah. either. So on other, on other animals too. So. Yeah, I want to thank everybody.